Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right, so we are at 11 o'clock. We're going to get started. Um, today's class is Bugs and Other Critters. Our speaker today is Master Gardener Volunteer Jeff Schneider. Uh, thank you. Sorry, everybody, for um, for the problems there. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and spending um, part of this lovely day here, one of our first ones in a while, uh, to listen in on this. We're going to talk about bugs and a few other critters in your garden. And I use the term bugs in the vernacular. We're not talking about the insect order, hermiptera, or whichever one it is. Um, we're going to talk about creepy crawly things out there in your in your garden, okay? This is the way I think most of us were raised to deal with uh, or think about insects and arthropods and all sorts of other things here. Um, some of you may be old enough, I know I certainly am, to remember um, the flit. And um, I remember my grandmother, you know, running around the house with this, this can sprayer here and trying to get rid of all kinds of horrible things like mosquitoes and moths and kids who weren't behaving and everything. And um, as you can see, it was great. It was improved with DDT. And if you recognize the artwork, yes, it was done by Dr. Seuss. Okay. So this is the way I think, even if you don't remember your grandmother running around with this thing, I think this is the way most of us are kind of raised. Our bugs are just creepy crawly, and they're, they're an annoyance, and they're to be done away with if they get too annoying. We're going to take a look at that attitude here, and we're going to try and think about better ways of doing this. So some things that are really key to to coming up with a strategy of dealing with bugs is, is to know something about them. First of all, you can't kill them all. There are just too many. We'll take a look at just how many there are. So it's really kind of pointless. Now, as a species, we might be able to kill all of them, but as an individual, you're not going to be able to rid your property of all the bugs there. Second thing is you don't want to kill them. Um, we're going to look at their role in nature. We're going to look at their role in your garden. And finally, based on that, uh, you'll see that you can get some of them, at least some of them, to work for you and ease your load out there in your garden and um, actually improve and enhance your, your garden experience, your outdoor experience. I want to start here with... Um, this was a, a British naturalist from the early 19th century, J.B.S. Haldane. He was quite a character, and he's always good for, uh, for a good quote. And the BBC loved to interview the guy. And so during in one of these interviews, the interviewer asked him, so what have you learned about the creator? You know, you're studying all these insects, and you're a naturalist and everything. So what's it taught you? And he replied very dryly in a very British accent that he, the creator, seems to be inordinately fond of beetles. And this inordinate fondness quote has become kind of the rallying cry of entomologists everywhere. You'll see books named about, uh, entitled an inordinate fondness. You'll see this phrase up above in entomology departments. Um, and so uh, it's just kind of the entomological um, rallying cry. But let's take a look at how he came up with this. Insects in nature. Um, there are 1.2 million animal species. 900,000 of, of those animal species are, in fact, insect species. So about three-fourths, right? And about a little over one-third of those insect species are, in fact, beetles. So... Um, nature or the creator or however you want to uh, frame it uh, does seem to be inordinately fond of beetles and in turn of insects and other invertebrates uh, and other creepy crawlies in nature. So there's just a lot of them, a lot of designs of them, a lot of different kinds of them. 
Less than 2% are harmful from our point of view. And all ecosystems are dependent on them, really do need them. It's just another way of looking at it here. Um, the species broken out by, by main groups here. Here are your insects, one third of these would be beetles. Here are the spined animals right here. Um, here's some other creepy crawlies, some other bugs, the arachnids, the spiders over here. Just to get kind of a sense of what's going on there. Take a look at bugs in nature. They're essential to the food chain. They really, really are. All those little um, springtails, if you have a healthy lawn, you're walking through your lawn, they're, you're kicking them up, they're all out of there. Yes, they're taking a little nibble out of uh, your grass plants and whatever else is down there. But they're getting that energy that's trapped by the plants and they're getting them into the food chain. They're getting them, they're moving lots and lots of of plant energy up into the food chain, up onto the next level, whether it's another insect, whether it's another bug, whether it's uh, a rodent, whether it's um, microbes just from the frass that the, the insects leave. And this becomes part of your whole um, nutrient recycling system here. And they're essential for moving live and dead animals and plants and dung and preparing that for um, recycling. And they play an important role in your, in building your soil, for example. And they're important for most plants. Um, pollination, seed dispersal, feeding them, protecting them, and keeping a balance in populations out there so you don't get overrun by the pests, the bug pests. I'm going to take a look at these things. Bugs in your landscape. Why do you want them around? Well, you need them for pollination. You need them for protection. Again, that, that balance in the species out there of bugs and other things. But we're going to take a look at actually trying to attract in some of the ones that are particularly beneficial for our gardens, the predators and the paras parasites and the parasitoids. And just all around you, you, you may be concentrating on your vegetable garden, but your vegetable garden is part of a larger uh, ecosystem in your yard, in your neighborhood. And so the bugs are actually a key component of this whole healthy ecosystem that's supporting your lawn, your garden, your trees. Okay, instead of doing a scientific one, we're going to do kind of a working definition here of bugs for gardeners. And most of them are actually in the category of benign. Most insects, the arthropods and others, they don't have really a direct effect on your garden or your lawn. Yes, the springtails are taking little nibbles of your grass plants, but you don't even notice it. And I don't think the grass plants even do either. But they are part of this larger ecosystem and food chain. They're feeding the birds. They're feeding the little skinks that are running around um, under your deck uh, wherever. There are beneficial ones, directly beneficial, and these are the pollinators, predators, parasitoids, soil builders, and the pests. And these attack crops, and they carry animal and plant diseases, no question about that. And they annoy people. Uh, but um, it's good to have some of them around because they do attract the beneficials. Let's take a look at pollination. Uh, without help in pollination, we'd only have peas and beans, conifers, and grasses, such as corn. Um, these would be the only things that survive. And I like succotash, but I don't want to have it every meal here, corn and beans. So I'd like to have some other things, and so we need help with pollination. We need pollination uh, to, to get the other plants going. About 80% of pollination is done by insects. And the pollination rank used to be heavily oriented for bees and wasps. You're finding out that flower flies... Um, say that five times fast. Um, actually, you're doing a lot of the work, almost almost as much as the bees and the wasps. Um, we'll take a look at them a little bit later. Uh, the moss and butterflies and beetles also um, add in um, on your pollination. And when I first started uh, getting into master gardening and, and learning about organic 
agriculture and, and gardening and things. Um, the pollination crisis hadn't quite gotten to the public, uh, into the public sphere, uh, but it's it's pretty. I mean, most people know about it now. It's it's real. Um, last year, uh, about 19 billion worth of crops required commercial pollination. Pollination um, because the native bees and flower flies and other pollinators have um, have had it pretty have, had it pretty tough between pesticides, habitat destruction, lack of floral diversity, you name it, uh, they've been under a lot of pressure. And so uh, commercial uh, agricultural guys, especially the almond people out there in California, but others as well, um, had to shell out $240 million to beekeepers to transport bees around the country to pollinate their fields just because there aren't enough native bees and other ones around. Some common bees around here. Um, of course, the poster girl for the pollination crisis is the honeybee. Um, around here, there are no wild honeybees. If you see a honeybee in your garden, say, great, uh, and thank the beekeeper. They are basically cattle at this point. Um, um, another thing I might point out on honeybees is for a vegetable gardener, for example, they're they have limited use. They're not as, as great a pollinator as, um, as uh, the reputation holds for them. Now, if you have a big almond orchard, they are, but not so much for a vegetable gardener because they really like lots and lots of monoculture. They're more likely to go after the clover in your yard than um, those two spindly cucumber plants that you have out in your garden. Um, the ones that are doing the heavy lifting for us around here are the bumblebee and during certain times of the year, carpenter bee. But there are other bees and um, flower, flower flies and others that, uh, that we'll take a look at. Little sweat bees out there are, are good in pollination. And the blue orchard mason bee is becoming much more common in things like gardens and stuff. We'll talk about the bumblebee and the, and the carpenter bee in a little bit. And if you want to attract or if you want to buy uh, Orchard mason bees, uh, this will be what kind of a habitat you're going to be trying to put together for them. They're pretty, they're pretty docile. They don't really attack people. They hang pretty close if you treat them right. Okay, if you don't have good pollination, this is what happens. This is what poor pollination looks like in cucumbers. <clears throat> you have any, have any things like this ever show up in your cucumbers? And you just did not get it sufficiently pollinated. Here's one that was not sufficiently pollinated, and here's one that was. I don't know. You see it? A big problem with pollination, uh, poor pollination, is blossom drop in tomatoes. You have about 50 hours to get that blossom pollinated and tomatoes are supposed to be self-pollinating but they're really not you really need a shake so you can go out there and shake them yourself or you can really hope a bumblebee gets in there because they give it a good buzz and shake that pollen around in there and if they don't get pollinated uh, that blossom's going to drop and there is nothing you can do about it you're not going to set free this is a fungus, but the fungus is basically taking out um, the aborted fruit of the squash plant. So, you wouldn't, so don't spray this with the fungicide because it's not the fungicide. The fungus attacking your um, cucumbers, it's the fungus removing the, uh, or the squash. It's the um, fungus is taking away the, squa the squash that's not going to mature. Let's get population control. This is where a lot of, um, this gets a lot of press these days. A um, little bit on weed seeds. There are some insects that will eat uh, weed seeds and stuff. But most of the, the, um, the emphasis is on the bugs controlling bugs. And there are a bunch of them. Lady beetles, parasitic predatory flies, spiders and arachnids, manids, dragonflies. Uh, these are all um, valuable uh, these are all valuable bugs to have in your garden for population control. 
got some heavy fingers here. Uh, just to take a look at some of them, this is the lady beetle larva. Um, this is the larva, and these are the aphids, and she is just feasting on them. Uh, this is a surfid fly, and there are lots and lots of surfid flies. This is one of the flower flies, and I'll just show you. There are a lot of them, and they look very different. So, in fact, that's why they get confused with wasps and, um, and bees, because they can mimic them. And uh, you're not going to memorize all 400 pages of these. But just be aware that um, these flies uh, do a lot of pollination work. Um, the flies can be identified. They have two wings, one pair of wings, where the bees and the wasps have two, two pairs, four wings. Um, this is uh, a larvae from a surfid fly, and again, it's eating um, aphids. It's a tachinid fly. Again, some of them look like they are several, several different species. Some of them look like big house flies. So my rule, big ugly house fly outside, leave it alone. And what they do is they leave uh, their eggs on soft-bodied insects, such as caterpillars, and they hatch and they devour the caterpillar from from the inside. Um, lace wings, their larvae. This is the aphid lion right here, and she is chowing down on aphids. This is the adult. You want to recognize them and have them around. Ground beetles are uh, voracious uh, ground patrollers. Um, they're eating nymphs and, and uh, insect eggs and things like that down on the ground level. Now we're cleaning up and nutrient recycling. We've got the bugs that will help break down dead plants and animals so that the bacteria can get recycling, gives them a better, better grip on it. And they're working out there in your lawn, in your woods, in your garden. They're working in your compost, in your, in your manure. Just two of them, best beetles, like to live in the wood. They actually will break it down. Um, they're one of the few animals that can actually do that and make it ready for microbial um, deconstruction. Pill bugs, roly polies, everybody loves those. And again, they are good for breaking down um, mat organic material into its component parts and doing nutrient recycling. Okay, so we, we know we can't kill them all. And we know we found out they're actually important, and even in our own yards. So let's take a look at how we might be able to work with bugs. Here, I don't know where that's coming, that noise is coming from. But um, So a strategy for working bugs, and this is based on the integrated pest management um, way of dealing with, with pests. Okay, and so I, I do want to take a look at the, the dangers of indiscriminate pesticide use. Um, this won't be an environmentalist screed, I promise. We'll take a look at some of the facts, some of the the issues that arise from there, and then move into a modified integrated pest management strategy. And we're going to try to be incorporating beneficial and benign bugs into, into our gardens and yards and properties. So the dangers of indiscriminate pesticide use, I think most of us are aware of these things. It's commercial pollination. We have to rely on that instead of, instead of wild bees and flies. The pollination disease, we've already taken a look at that. If you don't have sufficient pollination, you're going to lose a lot of your, your crop, your yield. There is runoff and soil pollution. We're working to try to um, minimize that, but it's there. Um, and we get, and there is such a thing as the pesticide cycle, which we'll take a look at right now. Um, this is especially prominent in third world countries, but you should be aware of it because it works in a smaller dynamic even on your own property. You spray a strong pesticide, some, some of the pests survive. Predators <laughs> and beneficials tend to be hit much harder by uh, pesticides, whether biological or chemical, than pests do. And so you wind up with a pest explosion. So you have to hit it with a stronger pesticide. And this keeps repeating itself. And you do start eliminating a lot of the benign um, uh, bugs that are around you, 
that are supporting songbirds or supporting uh, other kind of life in the ecosystem around you. So it gets pretty nasty. So we want to avoid this. So taking a look at, at the integrated uh, pest management system and kind of scaling it down for gardeners, kind of boiled it down into these five steps here. Planning for them, anticipating and avoiding problems. If you're going to plant cucumbers, you're going to get cucumber beetles. It's not a surprise, folks. They're going to come, okay? So you know they're coming, so you can, you can um, anticipate them and be ready to deal with them. Scouting. You've put a lot of money into getting these plants and taking care of your yard and plant it out in your yard. Um, get out there and take a look at them. Enjoy them. And we'll take a look at some techniques for, for um, doing this in an intelligent way to really catch these problems instead of just enjoying what you've got out there. Identification, pests and beneficials, and one of the most likely ones around in your property. You can't memorize all 400 pages of this, I, I guarantee you. Then evaluate, is this really a problem? And then take action, which is the least toxic alternative. So planning, use good cultural practices to avoid stressing your lawn and garden. A stressed plant is a, is a plant that's got a neon sign saying, eat here, all right? That's, you know, I am stressed, I wanna die, you know, come take me away, kind of a thing. Um, so you want right plant, right place. If you try to plant grass in an area with less than three, three hours, you're gonna have trouble. You really are gonna have trouble. If you're gonna try to grow tomatoes in a place with only four hours of sun, you're going to have stressed plants. You're going to have a lot of pest problems. So take a look at your property and put the right plants in the right place so they're not stressed to begin with. Second thing is get a soil test. This is a master gardener presentation. I have to say get a soil test, all right? So get a soil test. But the reason you want to do this is because you want to get the soil chemistry right. Planting tomatoes in an ac in acidic soil is, again, you're going to be stressing that plant. The soil chemistry has to be right, and this is usually the pH. And the only way you can find out what the pH is and how to adjust it properly is to get a soil test, to get the lining recommendations. Then when this pH is right, the nutrients that are in the soil will be available to the plant that you're designing that area for. Okay. Most things around here are very acid, and we generally want things a bit more neutral. Don't over-fertilize. This happens a lot, especially in vegetable gardens. But if you have too much, especially nitrogen in your, in your soils, you have high nitrogen uptake, this again will be a neon sign telling leaf-eating plant bugs especially to come eat these things. They are very attracted to it. And then use good crop rotate, good gardening techniques, especially in your vegetable gardens, but also in your lawns and in your, um, and in your ornamentals. And be aware of it out in your kind of your more wild areas here. And we'll take a look at this a little bit more, but again, anticipate these problems and use these techniques to, to avoid them. In scouting, it's really kind of a two-stage process. Look, learn what to look for anticipating, and then how you actually go out and physically inspect your plants. So anticipate what and when they're going to show up. If you've got cucumbers, like I said before, you're going to get cucumber beetles. Learn their um, life cycle. Learn where they overwinter. Maybe you can plant those cucumbers at a little bit different time and avoid the first um, uh, generation of them. Or maybe you want to skip them this year because they overwinter somewhere else or something like that. Anyway, you can develop uh, a plan based on what you've got out there. If you've got roses, look at, the, uh, look at the, the pests of roses and anticipate what's going to come at you. I do not have time to do growing degree days. That's an advanced thing that I'll just mention at the end if I have time, which I probably won't. And then go out there and physically inspect those plants there. Take a look at tips both sides of the leaves underneath there's a lot of activity going on underneath underneath those leaves um, 
the two to three day thing is probably a minimum, um, depending on how big your garden is or how big your yard is. Um, vary the time of day. Well, as different insects have different work cycles during the day and the night. There's a lot of insect activity out there at night because the birds aren't active. So you get a lot out there. Um, get yourself a little, little cheapo headlamp and go out there and turn it on and flip it under there. Hopefully the neighbors won't catch you out there and think you're a real weirdo. Mine certainly do. Then we have to take action. It's the least toxic alternative. Do nothing. I mean, it might not be uh, a problem. Take a look at it. Go, well, you know, I can live with it. Cultural, again, um, take a look at where you've planted those plants. There might be something that you can move them or something. Mechanical, here's your big mechanical um, machine. You're hand picking, but there are other ways of doing that, such as floating row covers. Then if you actually have to go to some sort of pesticide, there are biologicals and there are pesticide and there are um, synthetics. Oh, I'm sorry, the biological controls are that you actually buy beneficial insects, usually predators. You release them on your property. They're kind of expensive, so you want to have a habitat already for them so that they are happy and stay on your property. And then for pesticide use, um, you should consult the the pest management guide, which is put out by the Virginia Cooperative Extension and is uh, housed in um, at the Virginia Tech Extension website. And this is what it looks like. Um, if you, this is what you'll, if you uh, search for it, um, Virginia Cooperative Extension Pest Management Guide, it'll lead you to this page. There's the pest management guide itself. And I would encourage, and it's, it's free, and I would encourage you now that it's winter to, to take a look at it now. It's written by professionals. Um, it's a lot better than it used to be, but it still has a lot of cross-referencing and things to find out the, quest, the answer to the question you're looking for. So you might want to just take a look at it um, before you need to use it. But again, this would have all of your spraying schedules. It has biological recommendations. It has synthetic recommendations. Um, it's got it all. Okay, so what if we want to attract beneficial insects uh, to our garden? We're not going to rely just on nature. We're going to actually try to get them in there working for us. Um, and we want to be attracting the, the pollinators and the predators and the parasitoids, right? So we need to think about supporting their entire life structure, food sources, shelters, um, mating sites. And the 5 to 30 percent um, recommendation comes is an agricultural recommendation for farmers because they're looking at how much land can I devote to this as opposed to cropland. As gardeners we've got a lot more leeway um, uh, but it's kind of a good I good kind of a number to keep keep in mind. And things we can do is, is take a dedicated area, we can interplant, we can put um, attracting plants in with our other plants. We can use a cover crop when we're between crops. Trap crops are generally more for agricultural, but we can um, use them sometimes in our gardens. Here's some choices for uh, that attract beneficials. And you can see there's a lot of choices. Generally, you're looking at uh, plants that produce a flower that's fairly shallow and has a lot of flowers. So you're um, Joe Pieweed, your um, uh, Queen Anne's Lace, um, um, plants like that tend to be uh, the most attractive to, to beneficials. Do you want to go for your native uh, plantings? These are the top five native plants uh, for attracting pollinators. Liatris, um, asters, golden pods, projectiles. And pick them, 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 mountain mint. This is just what they look like. There are a lot of different varieties of these things. Um, some of them are uh, perennial, so you can have them around, such as this. This is a, a white cox aster. Um, but some of them aren't. By the way, this is goldenrod. It is not ragweed. Don't confuse them. Goldenrod is good. Um, ragweed 
is the one that causes hay fever. So taking a look at how you can do this, some ideas. This is an old vegetable garden of mine. Uh, the trees grew over it, and so I had to move it. But this is the vegetable bed over here. Um, there's an herb bed in here, and they do attract uh, several types of beneficials. The lavender bed over here. This is a goldenrod, wild goldenrod bed over here. There's another bed back here, which was dedicated to beneficials. And pie weed here, and assistant over here. And um, these things would be changed uh, to uh, here. Um, right inside the beds, um, this is a three foot wide bed, um, growing some late season corn to kind of nutrient scrub this bed. But the lap back four inches is a beneficial insect blend that's growing very nicely back there. And right now, um, the buckwheat will be attracting uh, beneficials in, but some of these other ones will grow later. And so you have food sources for a good long time. At home. And don't forget about other pest controllers. There's spiders and the arthropods are out there, birds, frogs and toads, lots of other things. And think about habitat for them as well. It's not just bug on bug out there or insect on insect. Spiders, man, they do a lot of work uh, clearing out insect populations here. Um, I just want to mention that there are one and a half poisonous spiders in this area, in Prince William County area. The one that you're likely to come across is the Black Widow. And she's pretty little, very glistening, shiny, has an awful looking um, web. It's a, it's a mess. And she generally hangs up down, upside down and lets you see that red hourglass there. Because she's this big and you're this big and she does not want to tangle with you. Okay? She, she does not. The problem is you're reaching into your garden or in your bean plants or something like that, and there's one in there. You didn't recognize the web or whatever it was, and you bit. So one, there are gardening gloves out there. And two, if you see their nest or you see them, wreck the nest. Um, and after you do that once or twice, they'll get the message and they'll show me somewhere. The other one, and I call it a half of a, a poison spider is the brown recluse. And it's recognized by that violin on the back here. The, the certain ID is that they have three pairs of eyes in the front here, whereas most recluse have four pairs. Personally, I'm not going to get up in their face to count their eyes, um, but uh, I'm going to go by, by this back here. The reason I say a half is because they don't really survive or thrive in this area. They used to be more of a problem. The good old boys out in the, out in the valley would come in and sell uh, cords of wood to homeowners for their fireplaces and things. Um, they can't do that anymore. Um, so there's less of this, but every once in a while you would get one in the, in the um, firewood and it would crawl off into your wood pile or into your garage and hide out in, in something like that. But these other ones, um, all beneficial here, and they all do the Cracker Jack job of, of clearing out a lot of the, uh, a lot of the insects and, and a lot of the bugs. There's other ones here, the Five Lines Gang. There's a young one, the older ones turn brown, um, but they can, they can really clear out a lot of, a lot of pests in your yard. They're general feeders, so they'll, they'll eat a beneficial too, but um, primarily they're, they're, they're good uh, pests. pests. Uh, Ridgeback salamander, um, there's a couple of them out there in my uh, leaf litter out in my woods. Um, they are also good uh, beneficials. Um, this is a cultural control. Um, it's one of my uh, floating row covers. And um, if I were given this in front of a live audience, somebody would go, would go say, hey, you know, this is a pretty lousy uh, uh, tamping down job, sealing job you've done there. And that's because I use my floating roof covers mostly for um, environmental control. Uh, I don't usually use it for, uh, for insect control very much. And so I'm not as concerned. Um, these people who call attention to that are correct. If you're going to use a floating roof cover, for insect control, then you do want to um, uh, 
uh, get it tight. Uh, how much time do I have? Um, right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to march through the punch. I'm going to march through the calendar very quickly, showing you sort of the rhythms that you're going to be in, that are going to be coming up uh, through the year. Um, this used to be a three-hour lecture, and I'm sure many of you feel like you've already been through three hours. Um, but, um, but we were able to kind of noodle around as we went and, and stop. And, 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 um, I've kept this part of the lecture in here anyway because people seem to, to like getting kind of a feel for what's, for what's coming. This is recurring. There are no surprises here. It's going to happen every year. And I ask everybody every year, is this a waste of time or should I keep it? And most of the feedback is to keep it. And I would appreciate your feedback on this as well. So March is coming up. Um, what are you going to do out there? What can we anticipate? The first one is winter damage. Okay, you really should get out there and take a look at what winter has done to your plants and you know, shrubs and trees and everything. Um, there may be in March coming up some tent caterpillars and some some swarming ants and termites. If you've used salts, these they do they are damaging to the environment around them. Rock salt is the easiest and cheapest, and it is the most damaging. If you use it on your sidewalk in the spring, you've got brown patches and stuff all around where uh, close to the sidewalk. That's probably where it came from. And these are the other alternatives that you can be looking at when you are de-icing salts. Magnesium chloride is the most expensive. Um, it's not harmful to, to plants. The muriate of potash is another very good one, the long-lasting milk. But it does act as a fertilizer, so you want to avoid this where you don't want um, early season fertilizing. Tent caterpillars, if you had them last year, is a good possibility to get them this year. you got to catch them early and kind of what they look like very early before they built that tent. And that's kind of what they look like as a mature thing. They are benign. Usually birds will get in there and wreck that tent and eat all of them. Um, as I said, they're not a problem um, unless you're having a wedding outside or something like that. And then you just want to go in there and do not use a toilet or flame to get rid of them. You will definitely harm the tree. Termites and ants may be swarming at this time. Just um, I will point out just the difference between ants. You've got this you know, sleek Ferrari looking kind of body here, lots of new electronics and stuff about that. And then you got this, you know, old 50s Ford F-150 body over here with an <laughs> FM radio and antenna. So that's kind of a quick way, if you can see these swarming things, is it ants, which is okay, or is it termites, which is bad. Um, just take a look at those. Early April, um, what do we got coming up here? Okay, the carpenter bees are going to start showing up. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. Garlic and bugs, they may be showing up in your broccoli and yellow belly. The carpenter bees, I do want to take a little bit of a minute or two on these because there's a lot of them around here, and and they can be a pest. They do not eat wood, but they do make nests um, in wood. And what they prefer is wood, flat wood surfaces that flat wood surfaces that they can drill into and then follow the grain one way or the other, such as uh, deck railings, such as outdoor railings, such as soffits, such as things. Okay, they're not going to eat your deck or anything like that, but they are going to make um, these, these nests. And there are two problems with, with them. The first is, this is what they do. They go in and they make this nest. They go out and they forage. They don't eat. They're not eating. So there's no sense spraying. Um, but they do make these big pollen balls. And they lay an egg and they seal it up and then they doing that. And that's why they're good pollinators, because they're out there mixing it up in the pollen and getting it all spread around. Um, then the uh, eggs will hatch, the pollen, they'll come out, and when they come out, they kind of bring a mess with them. 
later on the next generation will go in and will clean this thing out again it brings a mess out and that can really make the areas under your soffit up in your house uh, look like a mess <laughs> a lot of you don't like that can't blame them the other thing is after these things hatch and they're in there wiggling around and in there woodpeckers can and the woodpeckers will come in and they will blast this open. And that's when you get some. So, say it's a good news story and it's a bad news story. The best thing is um, once that generation leaves, which would be in April, um, get, get a, uh, a deterrent, no mothball, something like that. Put that up in there. And then seal that up with uh, a small piece of dowel or wood or something, and they won't be able to get back in there. Um, encourage them to go elsewhere. Uh, you might, if you've got pines, uh, blah, blah, lollies, whatever, you might see these in there. They are, again, benign. Um, they are soft fly larvae. You'll see them again in the fall. Not, not really a problem. Harlequin bugs are a problem. They'll go after your broccoli. They'll go after some of your ornamentals. Um, this is what their uh, eggs look like. They're very distinctive. Uh, you can crush them out. However, these have this little, what looks like a bung hole here. That's not natural. That's a parasitoid wasp has punched that in through the barrel and laid an egg in there. And that will destroy all of these, that will destroy these eggs and give you more parasitoid wasps. So look for, when you're scouting, look for signs of parasitism when you see these eggs uh, of insects and things. The yellow-bellied sapsucker, I want to point this out, this is not insect damage. Now, you have an insect problem because what's happened is the yellow-bellied sapsucker woodpecker has shown up, has heard bugs in there, and has gone after them, and has made these equally spaced holes and these nice uh, bands all the way down your, your tree. But you these are not necessarily borers or something like that. So just to let you know uh, what sapsucker damage looks like. Late April, um, we don't have gypsy moths here, but I want you to see what the, um, the caterpillar looks like in case you come across one. Check your boxwood. If you've got a hemlock, check them. Be on the lookout for um, the brown marmorated stink bug. Here's other stuff coming up. We'll talk a little bit about moles and rice. And Moles and uh, and mice and voles. Uh, check your uh, boxwoods. Check your boxwoods. Clean, clean these off. This is a gypsy moth caterpillar. We, as I said, we don't have these now, but they can be devastating to forests. So I think it's a good idea if you know what they look like. Um, they're distinctive in that they have six pairs of red dots back here and four pairs of blue or black dots up here. There's so nothing else that really looks like that. So if you see one, um, get it if you can on the leaf that it was on, take a picture of it, record the time and where, and call the extension because we do want to know about these guys. Check your hemlocks. Um, you really want to get these guys early because once they get um, this protective shell on them, you can't spray is almost useless. Moles and voles. Moles will be active this time of year because the ground is soft. They, by July and August, they won't be doing anything. The tunnel you see in your yard is a one-time use feeding tunnel. Okay. And what they're doing in there is they're aerating your yard and they're clearing out um, grubs and, and all kinds of critters under there in the ground. If you don't like the look of mold tunnels in your yard, just go out and tamp them down. Now, you should tamp them down anyway, gently, because otherwise bowls will get in there and they will use them for transport. They will use them for getting around and they will use them for eating your plants. Okay, so moles are actually beneficial, and their main tunnels are 18 inches to 24 inches down the ground. You never see them. It's these one-time use feeding tunnels up top um, that you see. 
Brown marmorated stink bugs are going to start showing up. Um, be on the lookout for them. If you can catch them early, you can, um, you know, handpick them and keep their populations way down. Um, their egg masses are kind of pearly white, uh, so you can find them. They're, they're distinctive. Um, and these guys are identified by these white bands, kind of check bands all, all around here. They're pretty distinctive. Early May, 10 caterpillars are gone. Um, check your azaleas. Aphids are kicking out. We're starting to really um, get going again. Check your azaleas underneath. Underneath that that um, that leaf there, uh, the aphids are coming out here. That's a, an ant taking care of the aphids. By taking care of, I mean truly caring for them, not eating them. So ants we look at as going beneficial as well as sometimes. Yes. Um, spittle bug, just ignore it. Or if it's in a prominent place, just knock it off. Those are um, benign. Canker worms are going to be out there. This is bird food. Oh, special event this year. Yes, it's the 17-year reunion tour of the cicadas. And they will be coming, appearing on every stage near you um, starting in May and going through July. This is the 17-year locust. The wingless nymphs will occur. They will pop out of the ground in early May. They molt and they become adults, and then they are out there, lots of them. Um, they do not eat. Spraying them is useless, um, and the adults are gone by July. And here's what they look like. Now, are they pests? Well, it depends. Um, the females uh, lay their eggs in a branch, pencil-sized branch up in your trees, usually oaks or fruit-type trees. Um, and then they, they cut the little branch off. This is called flagging when you see the, the tree ends come off on the ground. And um, then the, the, um, the eggs will hatch and they will burrow into the ground, not to be seen for another 17 years. They can be a problem for younger trees, especially younger fruit trees. Your established trees and shrubs, you know, they, they, they can handle this. They've handled them before. They'll handle them again in 17 years. Um, they just really not going to be much of a problem for your trees and shrubs. One thing you might want to do is put off that spring planting of any trees, especially fruit trees, this year and wait till the fall. And you will see the flagging out there. Um, so it's really up to you. Are they a pest or not? Um, I will turn 70 this year, and so I'm not sure about catching their next tour. So I'm going to sit back and enjoy this one. So it's quite a, it's quite a show. All right. Okay, late May, we're going to see, um, a lot of stuff is going to start coming out. Um, bagworms, if you had bagworms last year and they look like this when they're mature, you're going to have them this year. But if you see them like this, it's too late. Okay, so if you had them last year like this, now is the time to start spraying, either with a biological BT spray or with uh, whatever chemical the um, pest management guide is, is recommending. Four-line four plant bug, I just mentioned because it's a very distinctive um, um, damage that it does. People think it's a virus and start spraying it. Um, it's not. Wheel bugs, good guys. Early June, we're really starting to fire up here. Some damage you might see. <coughs> this is from a bee. It's not a bug that's going to keep eating. It's just it's a bee that's just going to cut a little piece of leaf like that, put its egg in it, roll it up, and put it underground. As opposed to this one, which is uh, a bad one. So look at your um, your azaleas, and this kind of damage could indicate black fine weevil damage, and that's a bad guy. Um, bean leaf beetles, just to show you, they have dirty necks. They are not to be confused with uh, lady beetles. Late June, bagworms last chance. Japanese beetles will be out here. Best control is get your neighbor to put up uh, one of those pheromone traps. <coughs> um, but 
uh, pest management guide. Otherwise, you can also handpick the. Um, if they're in your lawn, you can use milky spore. This is what an infected one looks like. Earwigs, benign. They tend to be like to get in my bird feeders, though. But um, they just, not to be, okay. Now's when in your vegetable gardens, these guys are going to restart sh showing up your, <coughs> your pests. This is a striped cucumber beetle, spotted one. You know they're coming, take action. Um, early July, June bugs, kids love these things, they're benign. Euonymus, if you have euonymus, get out there, check, check early if you had scale. Last year you will probably have it again this year and you want to get them before they put that hard coating on. Um, late July, we've got a lot of stuff coming on, caterpillars. Um, Tomato hornworm, um, you can pick these off. You might want to leave one or two, oh, well, to, you might get a cecropia moth. On the other hand, uh, nature might come in and help you out. Um, this is a parasitoid wasp, has laid these eggs on there. They will hatch, burrow into the hornworm, kill it, and then you will have more parasitoid wasps. This is a cicada killer wasp, and it likes to sit at, at wood's edge and will catch a cicada and paralyze it and take it underground, put an egg on it, and let nature take its course. They're going to be busy this year. Um, we're going to start, you know, we got caterpillars, butterflies. You can check these things online later on if, you, um, if you're interested. Um, we're going to move. I do want to talk about the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, this one has these, it's black and it has these uh, white stripes on it. It's a day flyer. It's a low flyer. It comes in for your knees and your ankles. It's short range and it likes hard side puddles for laying eggs. It likes man-made things because they're hard sided. Gardens, kiddie pools, um, left out, you know, pots, uh, all that stuff. Most Mosquitoes like to get in swampy, wet things, but these guys like to get into those areas. Now, if you try to keep those um, nesting sites dry or without much water in them, you can control the populations on your property because they don't fly very far. Okay, so after a rain or whatever, you know, go after them, use mosquito dunks in your bird feeders, in your, your kiddie pool, um, whatever. But we can get after these guys. They were really bad, and, and, and we've, we've gotten a handle on them somewhat. Okay, some things to watch out for. Emerald ash borer, um, let us know. Spotted lanternfly, this is a new pest that's coming in. This the egg mass looks like over here. It's like a mess on your tree. I think it's for that one, then to that one, and then these are the adults look like. Slugs and snails, they're going to be underneath things. Um, so anyway, so again, take stock of what vegetation you have, what are you going to be planting, decide which ones you really care about, and look at their histories. Do you have any past problems? Because that will probably tell you you're going to have new ones. Anticipate those pests and their life cycle. Get out there and scout. And take care of your beneficials and these other allies. Um, like I said, I don't have time to do this. I wish I did. If you need to suppress a pest, go through your IPM stages and consult the pest management guide. Okay. And whenever you do an internet search on a gardening question, and there are tons of good and bad and really bad information out there, what you might want to do, which I heartily recommend you do, is add extension into your search um, um, browser. You know, um, cucumber beetle extension, and that will get you all the information from the National Cooperative Extension organizations. These are all coming out of the, the land grant uh, universities and colleges in the country. So it's university based. It's not Joe's Garden Hints. It's, um, it's all the scientific stuff there. And with that, this is the Horticultural Health Desk, Portline. And um, call us up.
um, and make use of this resource. And with that, I believe I am done. Yep. And I will stop screen sharing. And um, I thank you. Those of you who were able to, uh, to hang on to the end. Good comments, Jeff. I think we've kept up with most of the things. I'm still working on the slugs and snails, but you, if you put a like a piece of plywood down, you can attract them in that area away from your, and they have a habitat where they can eat stuff. They are, I mean, birds do eat them, but they tend to be pretty abundant. There's also a relatively new uh, organic, if you will, pesticide that's iron-based. There are little pellets that you put out, and uh, the slugs eat them, and it basically tears up their insides. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> okay. Um, we don't usually share the slides, but it will be posted on our YouTube channel. We just have so many participants every week that it, um, yet I think toads do eat slugs, Grace. <laughs> um, so it'll be posted on our YouTube channel. That's VCE Prince William YouTube. Um, thank you for coming today. I think we handled the questions, Jeff. Great. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeff. We appreciate thank you presenting. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, let me let me know if there's any feedback on the calendar portion. I mean, let me know if there's any feedback, but especially yeah. if you're working whether to keep that or not. You're gonna. We're gonna send all the questions to you. Okay. <laughs> no, I, no, really, because I, I tailor the. Um, I go back and I try to redo the uh, briefing based on the questions, so I try to anticipate those. So. Okay. Thanks a lot, you guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Same, same day, same time, 11 o'clock on Wednesday, and next week we will have a presentation on uh, integrated pest management and plant diseases, and we'll see you again next week.